new details about a suspected serial killer named Rex Hewerman. He's a New York City architect. He pleaded not guilty today after being charged in connection with the deaths of three of the four women that had been known as the Gilgo Four or the Gilgo Beach Four, four women found dead on that beach in Long Island. Uh, Hewerman is also the prime suspect in the disappearance and death of a fourth member of the group. Let's bring back uh, CNN's uh, Bryn Gingrass. Uh, Bryn, uh, obviously a lot, a lot of work by investigators uh, and lots of forensic details that we got and heard about ways that um, they figured out who, in their view, is the killer. Stuff that police could not have done 10, 20, 30 years ago. What stood out to you the most from this press conference? Yeah, Jake, I think they were so descriptive for two reasons. One, I think because they wanted to tell the public, this is every step we took to make this case come to where it is today. And this, again, has haunted police. It's haunted that community. Uh, they wanted answers as to who may have committed uh, these murders. So that's one reason. The second is you heard mitochondrial DNA. Now, I actually had an up-close look at a case being solved by the NYPD where mitochondrial DNA was used. And if you heard the district attorney there. He said that they got they got his name, Rex Hewerman, basically six weeks into forming this task force. Well, once you have a name, the case basically works backwards. And that's exactly what he is describing for everyone. They got this name, Rex Hewerman, and then from there, they could go back to the evidence that they collected there at the scenes alongside that beach where the DNA, you know, had been weathered from storms. It wasn't that great. They couldn't put a name at that point. And they can figure out, oh, hey, there's a hair in one of in this evidence. That hair belongs to Rec Hewerman's wife, according to him. Uh, so they basically work it as a puzzle backwards once they have that name. And then, as you said, they were able to then go to the grand jury and start getting those search warrants, those subpoenas and go forward with the investigation from that point forward, which is basically, again, the cell phones, the burner phones, the searches that he was doing of family members of the victims, the victims' names themselves, uh, the sex workers he was still trying to reach with burner phones, and all of those details that are just so incredible to this investigation. And again, you just heard him say there, this was something that was continuing. They believe that he was still contacting sex workers, and they had to cut the investigation short because they were worried about the safety uh, of others. But I think that is why he is being so detailed, because that is, microchondrial DNA is a very controversial topic. It is approved in the state of New York. It's done by the New York State Police in a lab. Um, but it does come with a lot of controversy. So I think they want to hammer home. This is why we want this sort of technology, because it helps clear cases like this one, which has haunted communities for more than a decade. Thank you so much, Brent. Appreciate it. Joining us now to discuss former FBI profiler and director of the Forensic Science Program at George Mason University, Dr. Mary Ellen O'Toole. We also have with us CNN legal analyst Joey Jackson. Dr. O'Toole, uh, good to see you again. Based on the details of the suspect and the details of how he allegedly murdered his victims, um, binding them at the head, midsection, and legs, according to the DA, uh, as a profiler, what do you think motivated him to commit these heinous acts of violence based, based on, I understand that we're just getting the information now, but based on what you've heard so far, what do you think his motivation could have been? So with a complicated case like this, there's never just one motive, but this is a serial sexual killer. So these crimes were done for sexual purposes. And then if you break out the elements of the case, like the bondage on the victims, um, and then we, we know after the fact that he would call and um, call the family's homes. It does seem to be that there's um, possibly some sadism um, involved in these cases. The autopsy will bring that out during the trial or uh, the court proceedings. So the acts of, of how he treated the victims during the murders, uh, putting hands on them, binding them, each element was sexually arousing for him. So all of that becomes really the primary motive, I think, in this case. And, and, and uh, just to dive in a little bit more, drill down a little bit more. Why call the victims' families and taunt them? I didn't, I mean, I've seen stuff like that happening in movies, but I, I didn't know that kind of thing actually happened. It does happen. It doesn't happen certainly in every case, but um, oftentimes when people engage in that kind of behavior, that in and of itself 
hearing the fear in the person's voice. Um, if the person receiving the call started to cry, said, who are you? Why are you doing this? That could also be sexually arousing for the person who could be masturbating on the other end of the phone. I don't mean to be too graphic, but we know that um, that's the kind of behavior someone like that would engage in. So um, wanting to hear the fear in their voices is really, to me, pretty indicative of sexual sadism, which is being sexually aroused by the victim's response to the infliction of physical or emotional pain. So the physical pain was inflicted on the homicide victims. The emotional pain was inflicted on family members. And Joey, we just uh, learned that hair from the suspect's wife was also found on or near the victims, although the prosecutors noted that the wife was out of town. Um, explain to us the significance. How do you think prosecutors are going to use that? Yeah, Jake, it's very significant in as much as it then limits it down to him, right? What if the suspect's wife is out of town, then why would her hair be there if he's in town and cell tower and other information triangulates him there, et cetera? And so it becomes problematic, obviously, and it's a, certainly something the prosecutors will use, I think, with great success. Having said that, Jake, I do, will wish to tell you that at this stage, the press conference seemed to be a victory lap, and it should not be, and here's why. I don't mean to be the downer here. It's a significant development, certainly to that community, that someone has been brought to justice who they believe very strongly is the killer. We heard a lot of detailed information and evidence, much more detailed than I would imagine the DA would release at this point. But this a long way to go. This is an indictment, and I just want to be clear about what an indictment is. An indictment is an accusation brought by a grand jury, which consists of 23 people from the community, a majority, that's 12, who have to vote out in an indictment. It is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. It is simply an indication that a crime was committed, and the belief is that the suspect here committed it. And so it's very important, as they have this victory lab drilling down on all the details and specifics with respect to the evidence they have, which is a lot to overcome, to be clear, that there is a lot more to go. And this will be challenged in every regard, including the DNA, and whether the testing, although DNA is significant, was done properly, whether there was any taint, any contamination. So very good development that they have a suspect and he was indicted, but it's a far cry from a conviction. And that remains to be seen whether they will get it, notwithstanding the compelling evidence that seems to be released, Jake, in that press conference. Joey, Humerman faces um, charges of both first degree murder and second degree murder. Why? Well, the reality is, is that in New York, first-degree murder can be pursued against you if you are, number one, first-degree murder, if in the commission of, for example, a kidnapping or a rape, there happens to be a murder, that's first-degree. What is this, the distinction? New York doesn't have the death penalty. You can do up to 40 years in jail. As it relates to a second-degree murder charge, which is premeditated murder in New York, that's 25 years to life. Whether first-degree or second-degree, certainly you're looking at a life sentence, but I think the distinction as to first was because of the fact that whether there was some sexual, uh, you know, certainly uh, he took, that is the suspect, allegedly, uh, if there was a rape or the kidnapping, that gets you to the first degree. And as I noted, the second degree would simply be premeditated murder. So prosecutors, Jake, generally charge under both theories because that's what they believe they can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And Dr. O'Toole, a profile on a potential suspect compiled by experts reported on by the New York Times back in 2011 predicted, quote, he's most likely a white male in his mid-20s to mid-40s. He is married or has a girlfriend. He is well-educated and well-spoken. He is financially secure. He has a job and owns an expensive car or truck. He may have sought treatment at a hospital for a poison ivy infection as part of his job or interests. He has access to or a stockpile of burlap sacks, unquote. That is a rather specific profile, and if Hewerman is ultimately responsible, incredibly accurate, how do forensic profilers go about making these predictions? Like, where did the poison ivy thing come from? Well, these are really not predictions. What they've done is they obtained at, uh, from investigators at the time all the investigative reports, all the photographs, they developed all the victimology, so they were, and they also looked at all the forensic uh, laboratory reports. So from all of that um, information, 
that's what gives them the foundation to be able to say, um, this is how we interpret all of this evidence as they put it together like a puzzle. So they're not guesses. They really are based on a complete, thorough, and extremely deep dive into the entire investigation based on actual reports. Joey, is uh, this heading to, a, this is going to be a life in prison sentence if he's found guilty because there's no death penalty in New York? Yeah, there's, there's no question about that. And again, Jake, prior to that occurring, there will be a process. That process, of course, begins with what we see to be the arraignment. And that simply means that you're informed of the charges against you, your right to get counsel, et cetera. Uh, and then a bail conditions are set. We know he'll be remanded. What that means is there is no set of bail, which would allow for his release. Following that, there'll be the, the exchange of discovery that is the, the specific information, excuse me, that was released today to the defense. That'll be challenged. And I would presume if there's no plea, there will be a trial. That will take several months, of course, maybe even a lot longer than that. And then there will be a jury impaneled of 12 who would have to establish beyond a reasonable doubt his guilt. And in the event that that occurs at some point, I believe, which will be next year, if we're looking forward, if there's no plea before that, then without question, based upon the horrific nature of these circumstances and these deaths, it's a life sentence.